everyone and thank you for uh, your interest in our uh, webinar. Um, I would just like to uh, introduce to those who are not that familiar with uh, open air to um, what open air is. Um, the, the open air's mission is uh, to shift the scholarly communication towards uh, openness and, and transparency and thus facilitate uh, innovative uh, ways to communicate and monitor uh, uh, research. Um, to do so, um, we work with a variety of uh, stakeholders like uh, policymakers, uh, um, librarians, research uh, support staff, and obviously um, uh, researchers. And uh, we also uh, provide uh, um, a variety of, um, um, of uh, uh, resources uh, targeting these uh, um, stakeholders, uh, such as uh, webinars, uh, um, uh, guides. Um, uh, in particular, for um, uh, for researchers, um, we have an extensive number of uh, um, uh, resources targeting uh, different uh, aspects, such as uh, um, issues related to um, compliance with Horizon uh, mandates, uh, uh, making their uh, um, research uh, data, how to make them uh, comply with uh, uh, fair uh, principles uh, and uh, um, um, other um, issues. Uh, here you can see under the um, support section of uh, Open Air the, the, different, uh, um, the different resources that we have uh, developed uh, over, the, over the years. Um, in addition, you can also browse through uh, the, um, the open air different services that we uh, provide for researchers uh, among uh, other uh, stakeholders. And I would also like to point out that uh, Open Air has uh, um, a network of uh, national open access desks uh, that we call them um, NOADs. Um, so there is um, uh, a NOAD in each country. So um, if you're a researcher and you have uh, a question that is related to um, open access and open science related issues, you can also reach out to, um, um, to your NOAD and ask for their, um, for their um, uh, uh, support. Um, and um, uh, also, um, this is um, um, a webinar that uh, takes place in the in the context of the uh, um, policy and uh, legal task force that has been developed uh, within Open Air. Um, the the policy aspect uh, uh, mainly targets uh, policymakers and aims at uh, um, assisting them in developing and adopting uh, open science uh, policies. Uh, but in terms of the um, um, the, the, the the legal part, uh, we have also developed uh, um, a number of uh, resources uh, to to support uh, researchers, um, and this is uh, why we are also uh, um, uh, we have decided to to, to organize uh, um, this um, um, this webinar. Um, so, um, just to introduce uh, our, our speakers, so the first speaker is uh, Thomas Margoni, who is a senior lecturer in intellectual property and internet uh, law and co-director of uh, CREATE uh, at the School of Law at the University of uh, Glasgow, where he also convenes the LLM program in intellectual uh, property and digital economy. Um, Thomas' research focuses on the relationship between uh, law and new technologies, uh, with particular focus on the role of the internet as the new medium to access, create and disseminate knowledge in the information society. Um, our second speaker is Prodromos uh, Tiavos, uh, who is the head of the digital development of the Onassis Cultural uh, Center and is also a senior research fellow at the Media Institute in uh, London. Uh, currently, Prodromos is advising Athena Research Center on legal and ethical uh, aspects of uh, data uh, science. And um, he has also 
uh, worked in a variety of uh, national and European uh, institutions, such as the National Hellenic Research uh, uh, Foundation, the European uh, Commission, the Special uh, Secretary for Digital um, Convergence, uh, among others. And um, um, our third uh, speaker is uh, Jacques uh, Flores, uh, who is an information and research uh, data management specialist. Uh, he comes from a neuroscience research uh, background and his role is to support researchers and students throughout the various stages of the research uh, workflow, from data collection, storage, uh, management uh, and analysis to data sharing and accessibility. Um, Jacques is also a certified information privacy uh, profession, which uh, allows him to help researchers who handle personal data as part of their um, um, uh, research. Um, so that's it from uh, my side. Um, so I will now give the, the floor to our first speaker, um, Thomas Margomi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation, for having me, and for the very flattering uh, intro. Let me share my presentation with you. Okay, so hopefully you are all seeing my uh, full screen slides by now. Again, thank you very much. It's great to see uh, so much interest uh, in our uh, legal and policy webinars. I like to think that uh, um, you're genu genuinely interested in a, a legal aspect connected with uh, science. Uh, it's not that you are so terribly bored uh, um, to stay home that even a legal seminar may be interesting. Uh, but we'll try to do our best uh, to uh, meet your expectations. So as Marina and, and Gwen before uh, mentioned, I will start by offering you a brief overview of uh, how copyright law treats uh, um, data. This means that uh, my presentation will focus mostly on aspects connected with uh, uh, ownership and will focus mostly on what we call non-personal data, whereas uh, uh, Prodromos and, and Jacques presentations will focus mostly on personal data. So this is the first big uh, uh, distinction that we need to make uh, and that lawyers make when, uh, when we discuss data. And it's important to keep this in mind because uh, uh, for, for researchers, for non-lawyers, um, often uh, uh, data are data that needs to be used or reused or shared or analyzed and uh, you know the way in which the law classifies this data shouldn't represent an obstacle which unfortunately most of the time uh, um, uh, is. So I will offer you a brief overview of uh, as I said of the concept of uh, uh, data ownership uh, again, this focus mostly on non-personal data, so on data that does not identify uh, individuals. And the question, uh, the main big question here is whether this data uh, uh, is owned by anyone. So from a copyright uh, uh, point of view, the uh, traditional answer would be no. Data as such is not protected. Um, the specific wording of international and national copyright uh, um, instruments uh, uh, usually replicate more or less what I report in this slide, that is to say ideas, procedures, method of operations, mathematical concepts, uh, etc., are not protected by copyright. What copyright protects are only original expressions, um, intellectual creations, we could say. Um, and as a consequence of this, factual information and data as such fail to qualify for corporate protection. This does not mean, however, that there is no protection whatsoever from, uh, um, we could say, property or quasi-property point of view. There are other areas of law that may offer some sort of protection. And this could be uh, trade secrets, contracts, uh, data protection, which we will see in the second part, 
public sector information, etc. However, these forms of, uh, of uh, protection or of regulation uh, do not uh, commonly meet the um, higher uh, uh, standards of copyright. And this may be a technical distinction, but it's very important because it means that uh, the kind of protection and the kind of remedies that the law offers in these cases are much more limited uh, in comparison to what would be the case if, uh, um, again, data as such, think of factual information, was protected by copyright. What about databases? Because we know that I just told you that data as such uh, is not protected. This may be surprising, is in fact usually when I give live presentations and I see the faces of, uh, of the audience uh, generates uh, you know, sentiments that go from surprise to outrage because after all, uh, um, you as researcher probably spent a considerable, consider, considerable amount of time uh, um, collecting this data and uh, and and it's yours because uh, not only the the effort that you put in in collecting them but also because uh, um, the way in which you did that reflects somehow the kind of a scientist or researcher that you are a different researcher would have collected something different um, so let's have a a, a, a deeper quick look into this aspect and, and pay some attention to the concept of databases because databases, not data, but databases, which receive a quite detailed definition by the law, may be protected by copyright, but only the selection or arrangement, uh, or better, only if the selection or, or arrangement of the content of the database is original, then that selection or arrangement can be protected. This means that the structure of the database is protected by copyright, not the content. So if we have um, a database of uh, items that are in themselves protected by copyright, think of a database of journal articles, then both the selection, if original, and the content, the journal articles, are protected by copyright. But if your database is uh, composed by elements that are not uh, in their own right protected by copyright. Think of a Excel spreadsheet uh, uh, um, that includes temperature measurements uh, over the past year five times a day. Then the structure might be original and thus protected, but the content is not protected. Even if the structure is protected, the content is not. And that's a first thing to keep in mind. In Europe, and only in Europe, however, there is an additional uh, right, another layer, that protects the content of uh, the database. Uh, not the single datum, but only substantial amount of uh, data. This, however, only happens if the database, uh, the, the, cre the making of the database, has required a substantial investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the data. Uh, and in this case, uh, the protection is offered by the SWI generis database right, which you, know, you might have heard of, is just a lighter form of uh, uh, copyright. Um, it's important to keep in mind here that uh, only obtained data, not created data, uh, are protected. And we'll see uh, why in a second. So we are in a situation where a database could, uh, could not be protected at all, but if the, these three aspects are all satisfied, a single uh, database could be protected by three different layers, two copyright and one um, so generous database, right? Which uh, um, needs to be properly cleared if you, well, if you are the owner, um, you uh, possess three different rights. It could actually happen that uh, there are three different owners of these three different copyrights on the same database, so things can get uh, um, complicated. And if you want to reuse it, you have to ensure, or if you want to allow reuse, you have to ensure that uh, you choose the right license, such as uh, CC BY 4.0, which uh, adequately addresses all these three layers. 
Um, what about a third category of data, which is data contained in a work, not in a database? So the example here um, would be if you are in, say, NLP, could you extract statistical information about the English language from a Harry Potter novel or any other protected uh, literary work? Well, in theory, yes, uh, under what has became, become famous as, you know, the right to read is the right to mine. But in practice, no, you need a text and data mining exception. And the reason why, without entering into the details, is that uh, a temporary copies that are usually needed in order to create, um, to extract uh, information for text and data mining purposes need to be authorized. Um, I don't want to enter into the details, but it basically has to do with how the harmonization of EU copyright law has proceeded, harmonizing broadly rights on the one hand, but not doing the same for, with exception on the other hand. And this may create a problem because uh, um, a lot of modern data analytics as the um, you know, current events uh, show us on a daily basis in this period require uh, the, the extraction of, of information, of, uh, of principles, data correlations from uh, databases or from published articles which are in themselves protected. And whereas in other countries outside the European Union, there are flexible norms, say fair use in the US, but we could identify many countries uh, that possess this flexibility. Um, EU corporate law and the corporate laws of uh, uh, European Union member states lack this flexibility. So under this point of view, we are a bit locked in in, uh, in uh, um, the obtention of authorization from uh, from whoever the corporate owner is. Um, very important to keep in mind uh, is why we, I stress so much the importance that uh, ideas, principles, uh, and factual information are not protected and should not be protected by copyright or similar right. Or in other words, um, why does it matter for open science? So the goal of the law in excluding uh, uh, ideas and facts from uh, protection is to avoid the creation of monopolies over the information needed to, you know, by everyone in order to, to communicate their results, in order to create new knowledge, in order to uh, think or speak, um, and, and avoid the distortion to scientific freedoms and to fundamental rights. Um, the same it's uh, applicable to the protection of uh, databases. On the one hand, you don't want to protect created data because this would create single source databases which are dangerous for the circulation of, of knowledge. Um, on the other hand, uh, you, the EU law, at least the, the, the underlying idea, is to protect, uh, um, to offer some sort of limited reward uh, um, to the uh, makers of databases for obtaining the data because this would uh, somehow um, justify the investment that I had to make in the uh, obtaining of the, of the data. So in the creation of the database, not in the creation of the data. This is a database directive, not a data directive. And this balance is very, very important in order to ensure that everyone can have access to this knowledge, to this information, but also everyone can verify, reuse, and replicate this knowledge. And we all know how important it is the verifiability and replicability of scientific results uh, in this specific uh, moment, but also in general. We all know the, the crisis of replicability that hard sciences are, are suffering. So I have a few other slides. Uh, um, uh, here I have a few examples uh, regarding the text and data mining exceptions uh, uh, in the way in which they are implemented under UK law and in the way in which they have been implemented in the European Union Corporate and Digital Single Market Directive, uh, which will be implemented into the laws of European Union member states uh, within a few months. Um, it is a limited one. So just to be very, very brief, uh, the idea is that uh, not everyone can text and data mine, 
but only uh, research institutions for research purposes or for non-commercial uh, purposes. There are different combinations. I'm happy to discuss this further in the Q&A if this is of interest. Um, as Open Air, we have created a number of guides uh, that uh, ideally uh, um, will guide you uh, through this uh, complexity. Uh, some of these uh, uh, are taken, well, all of these are taken from uh, uh, the screenshot that uh, Marina showed you at the very beginning. In particular, these three focus on uh, the issues that I have presented today to you. Um, there are a couple of other resources uh, uh, in the second part of the slide that you might also find uh, useful. Um, and then I thought to also include a, a couple of recent initiatives that are specifically uh, tailored to the uh, COVID pandemic uh, and how they relate to IP and, uh, and um, uh, corporate in particular. Um, the, the first, to be very honest, the first and most important is uh, open access and open science in general because uh, everything that is under a CC BY 4.0, CC0, or any you know, equivalent license uh, can be freely copied, reused, and redistributed, and also mined. So everything on Wikipedia or on, for example, I list here corporateuser.org, which is uh, a very interesting uh, project, especially if you're based in the UK, that uh, will uh, guide uh, corporate users uh, through uh, the, the rights and the exceptions of corporate law in a way that uh, um, will, is understandable to non-lawyers. So if you don't know this resource, please uh, um, check it because it, uh, it is uh, very, very well done. Um, more specific and created uh, uh, specifically for the current situation is the Open COVID Pledge. Um, uh, the underlying idea is to make our intellectual property available free of charge for use in ending the pandemic. Um, it uh, takes the form of two specific licenses, one that covers the copyright and the patents of the, uh, uh, of the entity uh, adopting the license, the second one only uh, the patents. And it's very important to know that very big companies uh, uh, have, uh, have uh, adopted this license uh, in order to offer um, free, ability, free access to their, to their, um, to their IP, we, we would say. Um, a similar statement has been made by the uh, Wellcome Trust about sharing data and findings relevant to the um, coronavirus ad outbreak. Um, it should be clear at this point that um, all these initiatives have to somehow be come from the right holder. Copyright works in a way that is automatic. So you are automatically the copyright owner and automatically uh, all rights are reserved. Um, and this is how copyright works. So it's very important to, uh, on the one hand, uh, choose the right licenses uh, because otherwise everything it's uh, you know cannot be reused that's the you know one of the main obstacles that copyright creates in our um, digital and interconnected uh, uh, world nowadays so uh, uh, a fourth and last uh, link is to a pledge that a number of us uh, corporate scholars have made uh, to the WIPO because we need to build more flexibilities in the current corporate system uh, flexibilities could take the name of free uses, of exception, of a, you know other type of um, uses that do not require a prior authorization, because this is one of the uh, locking factors that um, slows down um, research in uh, in many fields, and uh, uh, this happens in the EU much more than in other countries. So it's also a matter of uh, uh, EU competitive, competitiveness in this field. I hope uh, uh, to have met the uh, expectations in terms of uh, time and, uh, and interest. Uh, I thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take uh, questions at uh, the end uh, of the uh, webinar. Thank you.
thank you very much, uh, um, Thomas. I, I think that we can now proceed with our second speaker. So, Prodromos, the, the floor is all yours. And just as a reminder, um, you can um, write your uh, questions at the Q&A uh, box. Thank you very much, Marina. And uh, um, I'm really glad uh, to be here and, and, and be able to actually give this presentation. Um, this is um, um, uh, in relation to um, general data protection uh, directive and how it is applicable uh, in the open science context. And um, the idea is to actually um, give you an overview of what the, the general data protection directive regulation is. Um, talk a bit about how data protection structure works, legally speaking provide you with a bit of the setting in a research organization, and then focus on specifically how scientific research is defined within the GDPR context, and then focusing on, on some very specific issues, the issue of uh, processing purpose, legal basis, uh, the limitations in the exercising of the data subject rights as a result of the scientific research <coughs> provisions in GDPR, and finally some cases that came from questions. And I will also answer one of the questions that has been posed in relation to um, um, the GDPR and its retroactive uh, application. Um, uh, this presentation actually builds on a previous presentation which we did in the context of these uh, webinars, the how open is open, uh, but it contains much more information and uh, we will go through the slides without going in all detail, but you can find the presentation available and you will be able to use it also as a, a key kind of guide in relation to open science and GDPR. Um, I always start with um, this, uh, going back to the title of GDPR, uh, the whole idea of the regulation is to actually enhance the free movement of data within the context of the digital single market. And it's important to understand that because just because there are personal data in uh, a specific um, uh, data set it doesn't mean that uh, you are not allowed to use such data sets. Um, this is also reflected um, if the uh, way in which any data protection scenario works. So you have the range of personal data which are to be processed and probably contained in your uh, data set uh, and then you define um, the way in which the uh, data, these personal data are to be processed the purpose of the processing uh, and finally the legal basis for, for such processing. Here we have to pay particular attention to the legal basis because um, we need to uh, provide uh, specific legal basis when we have special categories of data, what we used to call in the past uh, sensitive personal data and at the same time we need to make sure that the legal basis covers uh, what your work and, and this is really important because as we will see in the life cycle of a data set uh, this is something which is uh, in the life cycle of a data set this is something uh, which is um, may change so the purpose of processing and the type of processing may be changing uh, as the time passes let me go to the next slide Um, a setting, and we, we've covered that in the previous time we spoke about GDPR, uh, there are different ways in which personal data are processed within a research performing organization. It's important as a checklist to make sure that we, we, you've seen it, you've gone through your ethics framework, if you have one in your organization. Uh, but it's also important to see within which, within which context this thing happens. So within, uh, whether this is in the context of an EU or collaborative project, and there it is important to see which are the ethics and data protection requirements from the grant. Your national law, and I will return to that because um, we have variations in the way that GDPR is applied in relation to the data subject rights, uh, depending on national implementations. A another important, which we will cover in the cases, another important aspect is whether the data are somehow transferred to third countries or are obtained by third countries. And there you need to adhere to specific rules. And finally, you need to see which are the conditions of the call to which you're answering, because they may be adding, uh, providing additional ethical requirements. A tender in the European context is very different from a grant, which means you're probably going to be most probably the controller 
or co-controller, if it's a consortium of the data set, is very different from when you, you have a ground where you operate as the data controller. Here, uh, as the data, sorry, you, in the tender, you are a processor um, uh, or a co-processor. Uh, if it is a, a, a ground, then you become a controller because in the tender, you're probably processing on behalf of the European Commission. Uh, again, in a collaborative project, you need to see who is going to operate as a data protection officer for the consortium, not just for the research performing organization. And if there are multiple laboratories in your university or in your institution, also how have you structured the DPO, what is the DPO structure within your ecosystem? And finally, if there is an ethics committee, whether you have passed um, through such a committee. Now, how, are research, how is scientific research defined? This is quite crucial for us because uh, most of the work we do would be qualified as scientific research. The most important article is Article 89, which provides the main framework, but there are multiple other recitals and articles uh, within the GDPR, uh, which may be useful to you, and we'll go through them uh, quickly today. Um, Scientific research normally falls on under what we would call the broader public interest legal basis. So it is a legal basis for processing lawfully personal data, which very much uh, is in the family of what we would call public interest reasons, which means that in principle and as a starting point, you will not need to, to obtain consent, uh, although you will need to inform your data subject. And uh, I understand this is not what is going to happen in most of the cases because you will need to obtain or consent either because you're going to be in practice using some kind of uh, processing some kind of special category of data or because um, you are going to be um, uh, uh, you will have to go through an ethics committee and this requires consent, but uh, public interest is the main legal basis um, very frequently. Again, because we don't obtain data only from the field, but we obtain them from third sources, um, scientific research, uh, uh, processing personal data within the context of scientific research may amount to uh, what we call further processing, uh, or is, this is how it is defined in GDPR, but we, we also call it reuse or uh, further use or um, uh, repurposing of the personal data. Um, whatever you do with personal data which are in the context of scientific research, <clears throat> GDPR allows you to do quite a few things. Uh, however, you always have to have technical and organizational measures in place. Uh, these are two, the law gives us two examples, the regulation gives us two examples, uh, data minimization and um, it tells us that this is, could be done through pseudon pseudonymization, but any, in any case, this can be done and has to be done only to the extent that it doesn't affect your research objectives. So if your research requires you to know who the data subject is or the publication of it requires that, then you may not have to go through a pseudo minimization stage. In terms of special categories of, um, of, of uh, personal data, um, again, uh, they fall within the broader uh, legal basis of uh, public interest. But there, you need to make sure that you add three more elements. The uh, category or the processing of such data has to be proportionate to the aim pursued, which means that if, again, it goes back to what you can do with this data, do you really need them to be as personal data? And do you really need to publish them as personal data? Of course, you, um, the overall need to protect the rights uh, to data protection. You cannot uh, totally uh, you know, uh, eradicate any need to protect uh, the, the, the rights of the data subject. And finally, you need to actually, uh, again, uh, uh, provide suitable and specific measures to safeguard such rights. Again, you need to have organizational or technical measures in place. Um, so this is something which I think is the most important question. So which are such measures and how can we apply them? Now, moving from what is scientific data to the purpose, what we call uh, uh, processing purpose. Uh, again, here, um, the purpose is, uh, be broadly speaking, scientific research, what you do, but you need to further specify it in terms of the type of research you're doing and whether you are going to allow further use and exploitation. And I will return to this point when we speak about specific cases. 
However, what is important to understand here is that um, you may start uh, with, uh, at the collection stage with purpose A, but as you move on and you engage in different types of processing, the, the legal basis may change as well. So what is the uh, legal basis? We said several times about the public interest, but we may have other, I'll give you two examples here. If you're operating as a, uh, as a, a processor, not as a controller, in the case of a tender or of another contract with a private entity, then it could be the contract that is the legal basis. And in specific types of research, and as I said before, for reasons of passing through ethics committees, you are very frequently going to use consent as well. Now here, if we see the, um, uh, if we see the, the different types of, uh, uh, in, the, in the left column of legal uh, basis, you will see that public interest is what is mostly quoted. However, it could be legal obligations. So it could be that you're a public uh, RPO and you have to conduct a certain type of research. It could be public interest of a different kind if you are working on behalf of a public authority, particularly, for instance, in the context of COVID-19, and Jack is going to tell us more about that. But it could be also that you're contractually bound uh, and you operate on, in relation to, let's say, pharma, or it could be that you have obtained consent for all sorts of reasons. Legitimate interest, which is also one of the questions I have received, I think it is the one for research, which is the least possible to use. First of all, because you cannot have legitimate interest when you actually have as your legal basis, public interest or legal obligations. And finally, because um, there is no reason why you should go for these kinds of legal justification when you have much more powerful tools at your disposal. As I said before, it's important to trace the life cycle of the data and see how the, the legal basis and purposes change. For instance, I may want to conduct uh, a statistical research in order to um, develop some, um, uh, to write a paper on uh, epidemiology. So that was my uh, purpose and it's legal basis A. But as these data are to be uh, preserved, it could be that I preserve them not just because I did this research, but because this was European, a European project, so I may need to preserve them for reasons of auditing. Or it could be that I need to update them for reasons of, um, um, uh, let's say, corporate policy, or I need to update them for legal reasons in my own jurisdiction. It means that the writing, let's say the updating or the preservation of the data is done on a different legal basis. Finally, it could be that I, I share this data again for different reasons. It could be because of uh, COVID-19 that I need to share the data further because of a legal obligation, if such obligation exists. So what I want to say is that uh, every time you're examining a, a processing type and whether you want to assess whether you are compliant with the GDPR, don't do it in abstract, but try to see the processes that the data are subjected to in the course of their life cycle. Now, um, what is important also here is to understand that the, that the general data protection regulation provides a lot of exceptions in relation to how the data subject could uh, perform her rights. And let me go through them uh, more specifically. The first thing is that uh, the rights to, of the data subject to be informed is limited to the extent that these three conditions are satisfied, the provision of that the information uh, makes the uh, research impossible, or it would involve dispro disproportionate effort, it is the latter normally, um, but increasingly um, you need to justify why this is the case, because if you have had technical and organizational measures in place, it is very unlikely that you won't be able to provide the information that data subject requires. The second thing uh, is because that would impair the achievements of the objectives of scientific research. Again, here, you have to be, make a very powerful argument how you would do that. And again, I think it's very difficult to actually satisfy these conditions and at the same time be compliant to your ethics framework especially the ones we've seen in different universities and research performing organizations. And finally, in all cases, when you don't provide this information, you would still have to make sure that the legitimate interests of the data subject are somehow uh, protected. So it means that they, there needs to be a, a, a lot of emphasis on the protection of the data subject. 
In terms of the right to be forgotten, the right of erasure, the only way in which you, you can retain this data is if um, the, the uh, erasure of the data would actually um, totally impair the research. So it need, you need to make sure that there is reason why this data need to be out there. And, and finally, similarly, uh, the objection is when uh, the object, I can hear it would be a balancing exercise, uh, whoever is to actually um, understand, uh, make an assessment as to whether you should allow the data subject to object or not. Really, you need to have be very uh, clear that there is a, a bigger research interest and on that basis actually uh, to um, disallow the data subject to object to the processing of their data. Finally, what is interesting, and this is where you need to check your uh, national legislation, is that in terms of access by the data subject, rectification, restriction of processing, and again, the right to object, uh, there will always be the possibility for the member states to introduce further derogations. Um, so they could provide their own rules in relation to these four categories of exercising the data subject rights. So I strongly suggest you, you actually go and, and consult your national legislations in relation to that. Uh, what is important is that when we have um, uh, reuses of, uh, further, uh, of, of uh, personal data in the, uh, op, in, in the research context, this new re, uh, reuse has to be um, satisfying a certain range of provisions, and we will see that just now. So here I've made a collection of questions you have asked, and we'll go very quickly through them. Um, the first one is the case when you actually uh, harvest personal data from publicly available resources. Um, and um, in this case, whatever you do, you have to check always. You start with how did the original owner of the source obtain the, um, what was the purpose of the, the processing of the personal data processing and what was the original legal basis. So you need to have this information because you are only able to further process if you know those two things. And we'll see that in the next slide. In addition to that, you have to go back to the data subject and notify her about all the seven elements that you see here. Now, more specifically, um, if you want to repurpose, um, uh, to reuse the data, there are two scenarios. You are further processing data which has been obtained uh, for, let's say, reason A, and now you're doing it for um, research, scientific research objectives. Um, and the second case is that it have been, they have been obtained uh, for research, uh, scientific research purposes and they're being used for another purpose. Um, in, in the former case, you're, you're in a rather fortunate position because you actually, the, the regulation provides you with, as we saw, a lot of reasons why you could process them. Uh, but in all cases, unless there is consent of the data subjects or a legal obligation or another new legal basis, then you need to actually check five things. What is the link between the original and the further processing? What is the context of the processing? If there are special categories, whether you have one of the 10 legal bases which are necessary for processing special categories of data, what are the consequences of the data subjects and what kind of safeguards have you obtained? As you can see, these five things are quite, I mean, they are potentially possible for you if you actually use someone else's personal data. But if you release openly a, a data resource that contains personal data, I think it becomes much more burdensome for the commercial, especially reuser, to actually um, reuse the data unless they obtain a, a new consent. Uh, there is no legal obligation or there is a fresh legal basis. And finally, uh, there are, um, um, there is, you need always to provide the information to the data subject. Always remember that it has been asked uh, in quite a few times. And if it is uh, possible to pseudonymize. Third countries, if you are in a consortium with the, uh, an organization or you are working with an organization that is in the third country, we have a whole chapter, chapter five in GDPR that talks about it. Uh, what is really helpful there is if there is some kind of certification scheme or seal in the country where the data are going in the third country. Um, and in that particular case, um, uh, this would help you a lot because it gives you an understanding of the level of protection for this particular organization. But most importantly, we need to go back to the contract and we also need to see how this, um, if there is an adequacy decision from the commission in relation to that particular jurisdiction where you have an agreement with, 
um, and that would help you to also assess how this is being done. But what is very important here is the contract and basically whatever obligations you have, your um, partner in the third country should also have. Uh, I would uh, definitely suggest you to check the EC standard contractual clauses for data transfers between EU and non-EU countries, uh, which could give you more detailed examples of how a contract of that kind would look like. Um, another question, I, someone collects it uh, for legitimate interest, as I said before, a rather weak legal basis, and you want to do a secondary research use, you definitely need to notify and the objection process, you need to notify in accordance to the elements found in Article 14, we talked about them before, uh, but you need to certainly provide an opt-out process. Uh, we always suggest that people uh, that actually reuse uh, such data, they uh, send an, an email uh, to the um, uh, possible data subjects and make sure they have a form or, set, or a very simple uh, way in which they can um, uh, withdraw consent or object, uh, actually not withdraw consent, object uh, to this secondary use. Uh, further pro pro processing and accuracy minimization, I think uh, the question is to what extent are these two compatible or openness compatible with that? I think they are totally are. Um, you need, whenever you do a further processing, you have additional conditions. Uh, you should certainly um, be accurate and, you, and this is something you also, uh, in a sense, preserve through the notices you send to the data subject. You need to minimize uh, and you could do that both through um, uh, minimization of the necessary fields. So it has to be certainly linked to the purpose of you, your research and if there is any way in which you can pseudonymize or anonymize, the better it is. Health data in GDPR, a huge issue, um, and I think Zach is going to talk uh, more about this one. Um, it's always, there are always special categories of data. They constitute a form of further processing in quite a few cases. Again, here, we need to give particular emphasis on what your legal basis is. Final question uh, that was asked about what happens if I want to reuse a set of data that was collected before the introduction of the general data protection regulation. Um, the answer is, uh, is actually quite straightforward. What you're doing is further processing now. It, now you're under the GDPR regime. Uh, you have to go all through these processes, all through all these uh, conditions and steps I mentioned before, which have to do with uh, making sure you notify the data subjects and also making sure that you try to establish a link between what you do and what uh, it has been done in the original stage of collection of the data. And unless, unless you manage to obtain new legal basis or you obtain consent or you have a legal obligation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Prodromos, for the presentation. I think that we can now continue with uh, Jacques. Wonderful. Can you all hear me well? Yes. All right. I'll just share my screen now. Great. Here we go. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacques Flores. As Marina already introduced me, I work for Utrecht University Library, and I'm a research data management consultant. So I deal a lot with research data management. But over the last few years, given the importance of it, I've delved quite a lot in the GDPR and how it affects researchers. And what I'll talk about today is a lot of the things that uh, uh, Prodromos has introduced, just a little bit how we apply it at Utrecht University and, and how, it, uh, how it's been affecting us so far. So legal basis, this was already kind of covered in depth, but uh, so we mentioned informed consent, legitimate interest of the controller and public interest. Um, so one thing that I wanted to mention, mention about informed consent is that, yes, it can be uh, a legal basis, but one of the reasons why it's always there, even if it's not a legal basis, is also because it meets our legal, uh, ethical obligation as a researcher, right? So it's something that must always be there regardless. Um, when we talk about legitimate interest of the controller, uh, we have recommended it a few times uh, when getting data from social media. Um, so basically when this information was meant for the public domain. It's one of the cases in which we could use this legal basis. Lastly, public interest. Uh, so Prodromos spoke quite a lot about this and how you know we are a public institution at the university 
And I know of uh, a few universities, uh, many actually, that do use this as their kind of default legal basis. At Utrecht University, we actually use informed consent as a legal basis, mostly because of the ethical aspect of it. But uh, depending also in the type of work that you're doing, so for example, the, um, for the DPB just considered any research from COVID-19 as recognized as a public, important public interest. And as, the, as such, it would apply as a legal basis for any research surrounding it. A main reason why Azari Utrecht University sometimes don't use public interest as their legal basis is because it has to be proven that it is necessary for the public interest. Now, in many cases, this is uh, obvious, but we are still somewhat doubtful as to whether this will always apply just because we are a public institution. And I think as more information comes about in the future, um, then we'll be able to maybe move more towards public interest and feeling more safe in using it as a legal basis. Now, when we're talking about informed consent, there are four things, of course, that, that are quite important, freely given, specific, informed, unambiguous. Now, um, all of these are equally important, but one of them, which uh, sometimes goes, it's, you know, we, we don't understand exactly how much information we need to give or um, what exactly does it mean to be informed. So actually, Prodromos already carried this, out, already showed a little bit about this, but here's just some information that really needs to be there to make sure that you're being compliant. So, uh, I skimmed a little bit over legal basis. What I want to focus on uh, more so is purpose limitation. This is the second principle of the GDPR. And it really applies about how can I share or reuse data compliantly. So the GDPR really distinguishes between two types of data use. And that is the first type. So this is the primary use, which is where I'm actually directly collecting uh, this data. And that is for uh, scientific studies, for example. Right? This is initial data collection. But then we also have uh, data that has already been collected for perhaps another purpose, in this case could be medical uh, conditions and so on, that it is then reused for a, another purpose. This is a secondary use of the data, right? So this goes into the further processing that was already introduced. Now, why is this important? Well, the GDPR allows for the secondary use of data, so further processing, it is, if it is for research purposes only. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but what, what it really means is that even though we collected initially this data for a particular purpose, if we want to reuse it, then so long as this reuse is for research, then there are derogations in the laws that allows us to do this. Of course, if we want to do this, we do need to abide by certain technical and organizational measures to ensure that we're protecting the privacy of our data subjects. And what these technical and organizational measures are and what they need to be will also depend on uh, the data itself amongst other things. Now, some of these could be minimization, encryption, pseudonymization, abstractor, access control. All of these contribute, uh, also the platform that you're using, um, all of these contribute towards uh, making sure that you can reuse this research data. Also having the right documentation, a data transfer agreement, uh, the list goes on on how many things you can apply to it to make sure that you can do it. <clears throat> now, I wanted to exemplify some of it, what, what this exactly means, because sometimes it's, it's a bit confusing. So when we talk about further processing for research purposes, and we say that this is considered to be a compatible purpose, we mean the following. So let's say I collected initially data for epidemiological research, and then I want to reuse this for epidemiological research. So long as I have all the right safeguards, the GDPR says I am allowed to do this without, let's say, having to ask for reconsent. Um, <clears throat> now, let's say I want to use this epidemiological research for something different. It's, uh, in a sense, it's not that compatible with epidemiological research, but it is still research. The GDPR is worded such that it also would be able, you would be able to do this as long as the proper safeguards and so on are in place. Now, where we have some problems is that, let's say I collected something for hormone research. And I want to reuse this for gender studies. Now, these are both research. You could find ways in which the GDPR says this is okay, so long as you have the right safeguards and so on. But what we found is that this doesn't necessarily mean that it is ethical. I mean, some people, for whatever reasons they may have, even though their data was initially collected for a particular purpose, even if that second purpose is still research, if their data is being used for something that they don't agree with or something they don't stand for, um, we should be careful with that. And that's exactly where the ethical committee uh, comes in at, at our university to make sure that these things are uh, being looked after, since sometimes legal things may be uh, unethical. Now, all that being said, so, you know, there are ways to facilitate the reuse of research. 
uh, within the GDPR, you know, this further processing clause, this derogation for research. But even though you may not need reconsent in order to reuse this research, <clears throat> you still need to inform them. Now, um, Prodromos mentioned that there are some uh, derogations. So if there is, uh, if it involves a disproportionate effort to comply, then you can get away with perhaps not informing these individuals. Uh, of course, it falls upon you to show this as a controller of this data that uh, you've made the recent efforts and that you actually can prove that it's too much of an effort, um, which can sometimes be a little bit difficult. Now, let's say if a data set has no contact information and you've heavily pseudonymized it, it's the risk of the individuals are quite low uh, and so on, then you can maybe say you do not need to inform these individuals that you will be reusing their data. Now, on to sharing personal data. So let's say you actually want to proceed and share this data. Um, there are ways in which you can formulate an informed consent form to, to be able to facilitate this. Now, like I said, at Utrecht University, we use informed consent, or, informed consent forms as our legal basis. And some of the, way, some of the things that we always recommend uh, researchers is to tell them, to tell the, the, the data subjects from the get-go that there is a chance that you will be sharing this data for whatever reasons, right? Be precise and uh, inform them as to the need that this happens in research, because not all of them are aware that this is a possibility and allow them to uh, say no if they don't want to. The next thing is to be transparent about what you will make available. Now, not all information is meant to be uh, available to others. Not, not everything needs to be. So be granular. If you're going to give information about, let's say, impulsivity test scores, weight, age, and gender data, tell them that that is what you're going to make be, uh, be made available. And their names and perhaps other things that you are also collecting will not be for uh, privacy reasons. Moreover than that, it also goes into making sure that you let them know what you're um, going to put in place, what privacy measures you're going to use to make sure that you're protecting their privacy, right? So maybe instead of just saying impulsivity test scores, tell them that it's gonna be pseudonymized, tell them that their weight and age are gonna be aggregated, that all of these things are being done to take care of them. Now this is more also from an ethical po point of view to make sure that you are letting them know uh, exactly how you're protecting them and let, let them feel at ease in, in consenting to do so. Now more importantly, and something that we see a lot are informed consent forms that are done in such a way that they actually prevent you from sharing the data. And this is probably more important than the do's in some ways. But one of them is to always avoid uh, terms as fully anonymous. Well, why? Because it's actually very difficult to make data uh, truly anonymous, according to the GDPR. Their definition is very strict, um, such that chances are that your data under the GDPR is recognized as pseudonymous. And if you promise to share anonymized data and it's not fully anonymous, well, you can no longer do it since you actually made a promise about it. So it's better to be real and say, we will pseudonymize your data and share this than to just sell, sell them a story that's just simply not true. Also avoid promises that you're going to destroy the data. If the data is destroyed, you can't possibly share it. And this is something that we see a lot is in, in a way done so as to convince the researchers, uh, the data subjects, that uh, their data is well taken care of, that their privacy is gonna be protected. But uh, oftentimes um, you actually want to share this data. If you're going to destroy the data for whatever reason, be specific about it. Now, I know that when we have interviews, for example, we always say, make the transcript. And after the transcript has been, um, you know, pseudonymized it properly, you can delete the, the, the audio file. Now, of course, you got to do this properly, but this is some of the ways that you can go about it. Now, we also have to avoid promises um, that the data will only be accessed by the research team. This, I find this in a lot of informed consent forms. Why? Because it sounds nice. But if we're sharing this data, we're not going to keep this promise. Just as simple as that. Now, um, how to share this data? Well, oftentimes it's much better to actually share the metadata about the project and the data only be made available on the restricted access. So that when people request the data from you, the, uh, those, the, the requesters have to sign a data transfer agreement and then go over what particular things can be done or not done with this uh, data as they become controllers. This not only protects your data subjects, it protects you as a controller and makes sure that things are going uh, um, smoothly, right? It's, it's part of the uh, technical and organizational measures that you take to protect this data. Now, the, um, the basically takeaway message that I usually give researchers is that the GDPR asks you to be transparent. Transparency is key uh, on how you're using this data and for what purposes. 
and also that it's okay to work with personal data, even sensitive data within the GDPR, right? There are derogations, there are ways that make it easier to work with personal data if you're a researcher, if your purpose is research, and to simply make sure that you understand what measures you're taking and that you're showing this to your data subjects. That is, uh, that is all I wanted to show about today, but uh, I'm happy to now give the room away for the questions. Um, thank you, Jacques. So just before proceeding to the Q&A session, I would like to ask Gwen to share the, the link to the survey. Thank you, Marina. It should be in the chat. Okay, great. Um, our presenters are very fast and most of the questions have been uh, answered, uh, but nonetheless, there are a couple that are still um, uh, open. Um, so the first one from, from Rosalie that has, it's basically two, two questions. Um, so when the controller is not a public institution, but rather a higher education organization governed by private law, such as a foundation, um, engaging in, in scientific research, then legal grounds for data processing might be either consent or legitimate interest as opposed to public interest. How do you feel this impacts the opportunities and challenges uh, um, of what type of research may fall within this scope? Well, I think I covered that one a little bit because okay. at Utah University, we use uh, consent as our legal basis and not uh, public interest. And I don't think it's uh, hindered us uh, much uh, thus far. Sometimes it, it is difficult because you cannot obtain consent and mm -hmm. this is when, when it does become a little bit more difficult and very case specific. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the, the second part um, is about requesting for informed consent for from research participants and the level of, of detail um, um, that should be provided in the information letter to explain how data are processed which third parties will have access to the data and which technical and organizational measures the researcher is taking to protect the data. I think again that uh, Jacques uh, um, um, mentioned at least like um, the, in terms of the, the last part of the question, but um, I don't know whether you would like to um, add something. <clears throat> yeah, sure. So it just always has to be a balance because um, there's a lot of detail that you do have to provide. I mean, it's even said sometimes all the rights of the data subjects must be in there, which, uh, and quite honestly, is just not a practical use. So you have to find, you really have to evaluate what do you think is important for your data subjects for them to know. So for example, the right to withdraw consent uh, or to object, th these might be very important things that should be in information. Whereas perhaps the right to data portability when it comes to um, research data, is not something that should be mentioned. It would actually just make your uh, you can send on uh, ambiguous or at least difficult to understand. Now, something that can be done within the GDPR is to layer information. So, whereas the most important things can be done succinctly in, in one or two pages, extra information can always be provided to links or external uh, means so that if the data subject requires more information from their own end, they are able to obtain it and that you provide this information in a layered fashion. Thank you, Jacques. And so the, um, um, the second question from Claudio, uh, for being exempt, how can we demonstrate that there is a disproportionate effort on provisioning such information? So from my end, I'm not entirely certain. Um, so you have to demonstrate that you've attempted to you have to show that you cannot do so. Um, and it cannot be, let's say, as simple as I, I don't want it to do it, or I think it'll take too much time. It, it really has to be something that is preventing you from doing it. Now, I know from some cases that have happened, not related to research, that even contacting so much as, uh, I don't know how many millions of subscribers for a particular, uh, for, for information and so on, was not sufficient to say that it's disproportionate. Now, of course, this would be a case-by-case -case basis. How it applied to a particular research case? Um, yeah, I'm afraid it would really involve some thinking and documentation, writing things down and make sure that you've evaluated all the possible options. Beyond that, uh, I'm afraid it can be of help. 
if, if I may add something here, um, I, I, just to add to what Zach has just said, um, it does help to actually, you certainly cannot be totally unjustified in, in why you, you actually uh, not uh, providing this information. On the other hand, you need to have some kind of cost uh, analysis. And then this is the classic, this is the classic uh, guideline that is given throughout the DBR. And you also need to have a baseline of effort. So this is the kind of uh, uh, person time that is required in order to uh, address this question. This is uh, this for the size of my organization or operations. This would be disproportionate, but I don't think there's a single uh, answer to this. I mean, very briefly in relation to the two previous ones, um, I, I'm, uh, I think consent is something which we, we uh, we are very likely to see in a research organization for all the reasons that also Zach mentioned before. Um, I think legitimate consent, legitimate interest uh, has to be very thoroughly justified um, in order to be used as a legal basis for research. And um, unless there is a specific case where this is something which is expected by the data subject, I wouldn't say that's uh, necessarily the optimum uh, legal basis. Thank you. Um, we also have another question. Uh, uh, when research is done under a tender and not a grant, um, is it acceptable for the legal basis for processing personal data um, be fulfilling contractual obligations? Um, Zach, do you want, can I take this one or do you want to take this one? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think this is the classic, this is a starting point. A tender normally you would be um, uh, a processor and not a controller. And you have to see what the terms of the tender were and what the terms in the contract are. Um, so this, this is the basic, uh, the starting point in terms of your legal position. Uh, however, it depends really on what exactly you're doing. So it could be that you, you're not necessarily operating as a processor, or it could be that you want to expand the ways in which you're going to be using the personal data. So um, it is highly contextual. I would say the contract as a legal basis would be certainly the starting point, and I would investigate other legal basis if required. And also just to highlight, as um, it has already been pointed out by um, Thomas and Prodromos, that uh, um, you can also um, um, consult uh, our, um, our guides on uh, different related, uh, obviously, uh, um, issues and uh, um, that provide um, answers to, to, to some of the um, um, issues that we have already um, uh, discussed. Um, I don't know whether um, um, Prodromos or Thomas would like um, also to add anything also based on the, on the answers that they have already provided to, um, um, to the questions. Okay, Marina, I think if uh, we're, we're exactly on time, <laughs> I oh, don't think this, as this ever happens, uh, but I think unless any of the presenters have anything to add to all of this. Oh, so there is a question about oh, so from, a question about from Yadranka. Um, has it been answered? Has it been answered? It's an open question. Can the author of the publicly available and published document ask metadata to be removed from the library catalog or repository? I, I think that depends a lot on the repository or the library catalog. So it's it's, uh, it's not I don't see this as a GDPR question, but more um, as the whatever platform that you're using to deposit your your uh, your data. Well, they're the ones that allow you to whether change the metadata or not. In most cases, a lot of repositories, a lot of the ones we work with, metadata can always be um, 
what's it called, edited, whereas the data itself has to remain or be versioned. I, I don't know if that answers your question entirely. Okay. And also, if I recall, there was one question about uh, Dataverse and whether this can be used to store sensitive personal information. It was in the registration forms. Um, yes. So, so the Dataverse, uh, first of all, depends on which instance you use. So, you know, that Dataverse for Dataverse Harvard, there's Dataverse NL, and this will depend on a new particular institution. Now, whether you can store the data there or, or not, um, that depends also on the processing agreement that you have with whomever is running your dataverse. So if it's the actual university, it wouldn't be an issue. If it's in the case for the Netherlands, we have Dance running dataverse. We have a processor agreement that looks at exactly how the data has been handled. Now, whether you can actually share the data, well, that has nothing to do with dataverse in itself, but again, whether uh, the promise that you made with your data subjects, the legal basis and so on. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what I would suggest is that we close now uh, this webinar. Um, and uh, if any any other uh, questions, specific questions for one of the presenters uh, you still have after this webinar, please, uh, you can always email them to us and we will make sure that they that they will get uh, to the presenter. So uh, if that's okay with you as also, Jack and uh, Prodromos and Thomas. Um, Apart from that, I only have to, uh, the only thing that rem um, remains for me is to thank our presenters for giving this very, um, I think it's a very challenging subject. And uh, I think uh, you, you all did a wonderful job in, in trying to explain it in, in, let me call it human language. Uh, thank you also for the examples. And I hope for all of the few participants that uh, it was useful for you. Um, please uh, fill in the survey also if you have any comments or questions. Um, it's very useful for us to, uh, to collect this feedback. And then a final uh, thing that I want to say is that on Monday afternoon, at the same time, we will repeat this webinar. Um, there will be more, um, the, we will aim that a little bit more at re for research administration, but uh, in practice, uh, there will be a lot of overlap. So there's no need for you to attend twice, but if you have any colleagues, who might be interested, who didn't manage to join, or uh, for some reason couldn't make it, um, feel free to pass it on. Um, this, it's still possible to register for that webinar via the same form as you did for, uh, for this one. Um, I think uh, I will uh, close now here, and um, you can stay tuned for the recordings, which will be added to the webinar page. Like I said at the beginning, I will not send an email about this. Uh, and also Prodromos, I think, has a slightly updated presentation, so I'll make sure the version on the, on the webinar portal is also the most uh, recent one. So thank you very much again. Thank you for attending. Thank you for the presenters and uh, hope to see you soon for another webinar. <laughs>